Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunga Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off the Ball Network. And in today's episode, we're going to be breaking down game one of the Eastern Conference first round with the Atlanta Hawks versus the Miami Heat on the road. But before we get started with today's episode, if you are new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, do me a quick favor before you listen to this episode. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on our YouTube page. And if you're listening on any other podcast streaming platform, make sure to download all of our episodes and continue to share it with all your friends. I'd greatly appreciate that. And so would the rest of our people here at the Off The Ball Network. Now, without further ado, let's talk about game one of of the Eastern Conference first round with the Miami Heat against the Atlanta Hawks. Now, heading into this series, we all understood the Miami Heat were going to be the favorites to win, them being the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, having a top five defense in the entire NBA with a few all-star caliber players in Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and, you know, tremendous depth What with, on top of that, having better of body work for the entirety of the regular season in comparison to the Atlanta Hawks for the entire year. We all understood the Miami Heat were going to be a team that was going to come out with a lot of firepower tonight, especially with Clint Capella being out of the lineup, which I'm going to get into a little bit later on. But as far as the Atlanta Hawks and Trey Young, I was extremely disappointed to say the least about the way that this team performed to begin the game specifically. I felt like, you know, with teams like the Atlanta Hawks and the Minnesota Timberwolves who are fresh off phenomenal play-in tournament wins, specifically the Atlanta Hawks coming off of a huge deficit to send home a young Cleveland Cavaliers team that was playing phenomenal defensively all year, had an all-star caliber player in Darius Garland alongside Jared Allen and a rookie of the year candidate in Evan Mobley. For them to go on the road in a hostile environment, overcome a very large deficit, I thought that they were going to be able to ride that momentum similar to what the Minnesota Timberwolves did against the Memphis Grizzlies, you you know, utilize that momentum to their advantage, right? But obviously that was not the case. And, you know, Miami, this is a team that, you know, is fresh off of first round exit in last year's postseason run. And, you know, although this isn't the exact same Miami Heat team to begin with, you know, they added guys in the offseason like P.J. Tucker, who's fresh off an NBA championship. Kyle Lowry, he's a proven champion. You know, he won an NBA championship with Kawhi Leonard in that Toronto Raptors ball club their first in franchise history in 2019 and he put up phenomenal games in that entire postseason run to be able to accomplish that feat obviously we understood that Miami with all that stuff being said and them just being a much deeper team and you know just having the home court advantage we understood that Miami was going to come out guns blazing right and that that was exactly the story in the first half but defensively is what allowed Miami to get off to such a hot start to begin the game. I want to talk about their defensive game plan against Trey Young. This is a guy in Trey Young who obviously with Clint Capello on the floor, it's a spread pick and roll offense that's going to be predicated on decision making off of Trey Young's ability to get below the free throw line area and be able to make the defense shift. With Clint Capella being out of the lineup and John Collins the minutes restriction and not playing as many games here as of late and not having all that much rhythm, we understood Trey Young's ability to produce offensively was going to be a lot tougher. And since Miami was able to close the gaps of the half court defense, they weren't allowing any dribble drive penetrations all that much in the half court setting, got back in transition defensively, and then on top of that, defending the pick and roll at a very high level, packing the free throw line area to take away and limit Trey Young's options from an offensive perspective that all allowed them to get going in transition they allowed guys like Duncan Robinson to have a little bit of momentum in the half court setting and since Atlanta was working so much harder on the offensive side of the basketball it allowed their defense to kind of you know decimate a little bit and give up a lot of opportunities to the Miami Heat in a half court setting and just to begin with we already understand the Atlanta Hawks are not that potent and they don't have the personnel defensively to really be that adequate of a defense right they win ball games off the ability of Trey Young being able to carry offensive and you know just them being able to carry that offensive momentum to the defensive side of the basketball and since with Clint Capella out of the game Trey Young and whoever was the screener sometimes John Collins or whoever else may have been you know the ball screener for Trey Young in those instances they just didn't have the gravity to be able to you know draw the defense in and a lot of it like I mentioned has to do with the fact that Miami came out with a great defensive game plan and they didn't give Trey Young any specific driving angles right you know it was a lot of deep corner dribble penetration for Trey Young if he was able to get the below the free throw line area he wasn't able to get inside the painted area whatsoever maybe he was two to three feet outside of it and offensively Miami they were just able to 
take advantage of the Atlanta Hawks in subsequent rotations defensively, right? We understand they don't have guys that are, you know, uh, that literate defensively outside of DeAndre Hunter, who has been phenomenal for them in his tenure with the Atlanta Hawks since he's been drafted, right? But I felt like, you know, maybe this is a series where they could have probably benefited of having a guy like Cam Reddish, um, just given Trey Young, he's not gonna be able to beat this Miami Heat defense all alone, right? You're gonna need multiple individual shot creators in a half court offense, right? And they have a few guys like Bogdanovich who has been great scoring the basketball and was number one in scoring off the bench as a six man since March 18th. We understand Tyler Hero, you know, he's probably gonna come away with the six man of the year award, but Bogdanovich is one of the better bench players in the entire NBA from a scoring perspective as well, right? And I think the Atlanta Hawks are definitely gonna have to lean on guys like him, Gallinari, Obviously, Kevin Hurt is going to have to knock down open opportunities because he just doesn't do a whole lot off the dribble. So I'm not going to ask him to be able to do that. Right. But defensively, you know, this Atlanta Hawks team, they're not going to win off their defensive scheming. Right. Although Miami, they don't have a lot of individual creators in terms of their half court offense. This is a team that, you know, does a great job in terms of, you know, just being a read and react offense, implementing a lot of pistol action. And since they have the personnel with a lot of spacing that allows dribble drive penetration for guys like Jimmy Butler, and he's able to, you know, hunt out mismatches and pick rolls in certain scenarios and just be able to isolate in the, in the short corner in the mid post area because of the added spacing that the half court offense provides. He's going to have a really easy job in terms of, you know, just being able to produce offensively, right? One thing that I saw noticed, right? They were doing a lot of face cutting, right? And just being able to get open opportunities around the rim. And there were a lot of instances where Bam at a bio coming off of a cross screen, a simple cross screen or just a face cut in a half court setting. And he was surprised at how open he was coming out of that action. And, you know, sometimes it, it threw him off for a loop to a certain degree in certain instances. Miami is going to be one of those teams that's going to predicate themselves on the defensive side of the basketball. And most importantly, I thought one of the biggest things that we have to take note of is Duncan Robinson's production in a half court setting coming off of the bench in tonight's game since atlanta is one of those teams that don't have great subsequent rotations don't do a great job in terms of closing out to shooters this is the perfect series for the miami heat shooters guys like duncan robinson tyler hero who have been open on multiple opportunities in a half court setting it's going to allow those guys to really build momentum and you know really get themselves into a rhythm offensively for this series and you saw that on display you know for the entire game in game one you know duncan robinson finished the night with 27 points off the bench nine of ten in terms of shooting from the field and you know defensively he wasn't too bad either but with those things being said with miami having that added depth with clint capella being outside of the lineup and not being able to provide much rim protection miami made an emphasis that they're going to make a lot of attacks around the rim and they're going to start the game off putting pressure on that rim and being able to you know score around the painted area and defensively on the other side of the basketball the reason why clint capella is so important for the atlanta hawks outside of him being able to get them into their pick and roll action and being you know a phenomenal piece for them on the offensive glass and defensive rebound he was a guy that was going to be able to provide some rim protection against these Miami Heat shooters, right? Because, you know, Miami is one of those teams, if they don't have any options on the outside, they're typically going to run guys off that pistol action, getting all the way downhill and being able to, you know, find opportunities around the rim area and maybe find another opportunity on kickouts for half court setting from that perspective. But since Clint Capella wasn't able to be there, they had no rim protection. John Collins had was on a minutes restriction, like I mentioned. There was a few instances where, you know, John Collins wasn't even defending within the entire interior right he was defending guys like jimmy butler spaced out on the perimeter and you know miami just did such a great job of being able to maximize on all the advantages that they were able to have in this ball game now when we're talking about the atlanta hawks with trey young obviously we're going to get the elephant out of the room trey young only eight points worst outing this entire season including the regular season you know this team in the first half the atlanta hawks shot 28.9 percent in the first half which is the lowest shooting percentage for them in the entire half this entire season and you're just not going to be able to win ball games doing that right and one gripe that i have with teams that predicate themselves when you allow one player to dictate everything that they do offensively teams like the dallas mavericks and the atlanta hawks with trey young you know those teams don't offer a lot of offensive misdirection right and i think when you're the atlanta hawks you're going to want this at miami heat defense to shift because they are going to be so alert if you have a bunch of guys just being standstill on the defensive side of the basketball. And it just takes away opportunities for guys like Kevin Herter to get themselves going. And I just would have liked Nate McMillan to be able to implement something, some more movement off ball. That way you can make 
the job of guys like Trey Young a little bit easier. But you know, other than that, Miami obviously is gonna probably win game two due to the fact that they're probably gonna be able to take advantage of some of those advantages that they have with Clint Capella being out of the lineup, John Collins on a minutes restriction, and the fact that, you know, this team has tremendous depth and the defensive personnel to be able to limit lack of offensive production that Atlanta's gonna be able to give you in this series. Miami probably will win this series very easily, especially if Clint Capella doesn't come back anytime soon. With them playing much better here as of late, but not having the basketball stick in one area, and 15 of their 18 field goals in the first half were assisted, they're doing a great job of sharing the basketball and just playing really interconnected. So with all that stuff being said, I think Miami obviously is gonna win the series. Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat are more than likely gonna come out of this series with a win in probably less than six games, if not less than five. But hey, thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode with me here on the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating, like, comment, and subscribe, turn on post notification, and give us a nice review and a five-star rating on all our podcast streaming platforms. But besides that it's your boy nicey chunga mini you're listening to the ball fake podcast and we out praise god